They say truth often becomes a tale, and tales rarely become a legend. No war in history is unaffected by biases, misinformation, and controversies. From Egyptian pharaoh Ramses claiming to be the victor of the Battle of Kadesh in historical records, to the use of POWs to spread propaganda in the Vietnam conflict, there are a lot of war military stories that people do believe. Welcome to Nutty History, and today we're looking back at the so-called facts about the military and wars that are simply not true. The Standards of the Spartans This is Sparta. It has become nearly impossible not to mentally picture Gerard Butler and his funny, seductive Spartans in that skimpy armor when somebody yells Sparta. I mean, look at those bare pecs and abs. Were Frank Miller and Zack Snyder imagining King Leonidas I and his men deflecting Persian arrows with their muscles and oily skin? Well, whatever was on Miller and Snyder's minds while drawing the visual novel and creating the design for the movie 300, their idea of idiotic masculinity in the war was quite far from reality. Though it is true Spartans were rather lightly armored than the rest of the Greek soldiers, they definitely didn't charge only half-dressed into battle. During the early years of Spartan settlements, they wore bronze carosses, leg greaves, and helmets while carrying shields into battle. Hey, at least they got some of it right in the movie, right? But long before the time of the legendary Battle of Thermopylae, Spartans had already begun to wear armor instead of carosses and even added more protection to their helmets. The helmets of the Classic Age were built to provide as much safety to the head as possible. Spartans were thick, but they were not thick-headed, if you know what I mean. Spartans had their helmets manufactured by the crafty and talented smiths of Corinth that were so safe that all of the Greeks began to ask them for bulk orders, and as far as we know, Corinth kept on making armor and profiting from supplying it even to the enemy states led by Athenians during the Peloponnesian Wars. And why wouldn't they? The design was near perfect to negate a great amount of the chances against the noggin taking damage while providing flexibility and agility and most importantly, good vision. You gotta have good vision. On top of that, the design was so cool and intimidating. Even in modern times, artists have been inspired by it to create awesome characters such as Dr. Fate. The Spartans added their signature red horsehair crest to these helmets themselves. Soon, this trend was also copied by not only Greeks but also Romans years later. Now, unlike art, movies, and TV shows that slapped these crests on every soldier's helmet, the reality was these crests were a sign of honor and were reserved for higher ranks of military officers only. The whole point of these tall crests was similar to the stars on the shoulder ribbon racks of the modern militaries. The taller the crest, the higher the rank. There's a hint in that statement, I'll let you figure it out. Similar to crests, there is another common misconception about Spartans among history aficionados that every Spartan man had to serve in the army, and no matter the situation, they would be beaten, thrown into bad conditions, manipulated and hardened to serve Sparta on the battlefield, or as a certain generation likes to say, make a man out of them. Utter falsehood. Even though this fact has been used for decades by many modern militaries as propaganda to strengthen their numbers during wars, Spartans knew very well that not everyone was built to withstand the horrors and hardships of war, and these are the Spartans that we're talking about. The whole motto of their warcraft was to have no weakness on the field, so why would they waste their time, energy, and other resources on building a man out of individuals wired for other jobs? Well, the simple answer is they didn't. Men who failed to live up to the standards of idle Spartan soldiers were sent back to oversee or work in the farms, do trade, or do other such less important jobs in the Spartan society. But these discharged recruits faced the worst kind of humiliation and ridicule when they were kicked out of the Spartan army's training ground, but not punished or forced to participate in wars in any capacity. 300 got that part right with Ephialtes, and speaking of 300, again, the number is a lie, even though I think most of you know that already. The actual number of men fighting against the Persian army was around 7,000. And not all of them were Spartans either. Unlike the common myth strengthened yet again by 300, other Greek states didn't completely ignore Leonidas' call for an alliance against the Persians. Every state sent some men that they thought was an appropriate number to not sour the diplomacy with Spartans or the men they could actually afford. The Roman Retellings The first mighty transcontinental empire of Rome has been the subject of inspiration for many excellent artistic pieces. From Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar to arguably the pinnacle of modern comedy The Life of Brian by Monty Python. Oh yeah, and of course there's that amazing docudrama called Rome, where no expense was spared to recreate some of the most important moments of Western antiquity. In return, art has also affected our perception of history with its creative liberties. Let's just keep it real. 
For example, the myth that the last words ever spoken by Julius Caesar were et tu brute, which means and you Brutus, that originated from Shakespeare's play. Nobody knows if Caesar made a snide remark about Brutus's treachery or if that was the last thing he actually said. In the realms of possibilities, he could have expressed his disappointment about missing the next trip to have some ancient Roman fast food in a thermopolium. Everybody loves a good bobby, mate. But let's just stick to the army myths because that's what this video is about. Let's start with one of the Roman military alternatives that could be at par with the whole et tu brute when it comes to the Mandela effect. Gaius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, better known as Caligula, had so much love for his dear horse, Incitatus. Many believe that Caligula's affection for his horse was far above and beyond his love for his wife, his kids, or even his parents. Despite ruling Rome for a short stint of four years, Caligula did enough wrong to get his name in the annals of history because, as you know, infamy is also a way to become famous. Caligula was a pure twisted soul with a messed up head. He loved his horse, but that love was only equal to his hatred of other people. The horse would be asked to join him for dinner in the palace and would be served with the finest oats covered in gold flakes. He gave Incitatus a marble stall, an ivory manger, a jeweled collar, and even a house. These stories even suggest that at a time Caligula was planning to make his dearest horse a consul. Now, if you're not familiar with the intricacies of ancient Roman politics, a consul was a member of the inner circle of the top hierarchy in the ancient Roman army. Consuls were mostly elected by the soldiers themselves, so an appointment from the emperor was always a delicate matter of politics. But even if the story was true, apparently, after giving it some thought, Caligula didn't go through with his decision, so no horse was decorated until Lieutenant Peanut Butter in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yes, you heard that right. The whole story is most likely fictional along with most of the accounts of Caligula's insanity. There are far worse things credited to Caligula than loving his horse to the level of literal madness. But all of these anecdotes are probably a fabrication of Suetonius, a Roman historian who published a biography of Caligula some 80 years after the death of the eccentric emperor. The book is filled with really extraordinary depraved stories from the life of Caligula, but those stories have hardly any evidence backing them up. Romans didn't use peasants for rowing their war vessels either as depicted in Ben-Hur, nor were they responsible for a certain German dictator's special salute as portrayed in the painting, The Oath of Horatii. Also, pretty sure here, the Romans didn't have a British accent as every movie TV show likes to enforce the idea upon us. The dodgy details of World War II. The soldiers fought them on beaches, they fought them on the landing grounds, they fought them on the fields and streets, and they fought them on the hills. You ever wonder why a British Prime Minister gave that iconic speech if D-Day was largely an American endeavor? We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Because it wasn't the case. Yes, Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers are all about glorifying American contributions on D-Day, but the Americans were not ramboing their way alone on the beaches of Normandy. This myth often finds its roots in the fact that Operation Overlord was led by the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who happened to be an American. The plan for Operation Overlord was the brainchild of General Sir Bernard Montgomery, who arguably has the most British name that was ever Britished. Not to mention, Eisenhower's deputy was Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, also British, and the tactical air force that was directly supporting the ground troops were also led by Air Marshal Mary Cunningham. Can you guess his nationality? Bueller? Bueller? Yes, it's British. But Mr. Nutty History, you're forgetting one thing. The war is won by soldiers risking their lives on the field, not by the generals and commanders smoking their pipes from miles afar in their cozy war lounges. And I knew you would say that. Well, let's tally the soldiers of the Normandy Offensive. Out of 1,213 warships involved in Operation Overlord, only 200 were American and 892 were British. Americans' contribution to the number of aircrafts deployed was a grand 805. The British only sent 3,261 aircraft. Operation Neptune was also a responsibility of the Royal Navy, not the United States Navy. Great Britain also provided 31% of American supplies during the operation. Let me say this. These facts do not belittle the sacrifices of our veterans and martyrs, and American troops who participated in this adversity deserve the glory and gratitude that has been granted for them. But so do British, French, and other Allied men and women who did their part in saving the world from rampant fascism. Things weren't always smooth between allies either. According to American historian Edward Gorton and British author David Ramsey, the conflict of personalities between key military commanders of the U.S. and Great Britain became a repeated hindrance in optimizing the gains from the Normandy invasion and needlessly lengthened the war. There was also the matter of the rumor that American forces were ill-disciplined amateurs while German units were the best military of its time. 
While those facts were true at the beginning of the Second World War, the tables had turned very much by 1942. The American men who stormed the beaches were the finest of the finest soldiers as the 77-day long campaign of Normandy will recreate the history of the U.S. Army forever. These men were training for four years for this day, while most Germans holding the shores were trained only for a few weeks. The Kampfgruppen were ad hoc units born out of extreme shortages and desperation towards the end of the war. The Fallschirmjager, or German paratroopers, were rumored to be the best, but one of them confessed to a journalist that they had no training whatsoever. The German army was down to horses, carts, and their own feet for transport. The Mongol Menace Like the early offensive of the German army in World War II, the Blitzkrieg, history remembers one more storming army that terrorized not just Europe, but the entire Eurasian steppes. The galloping horses of Genghis Khan, the Great Mongolian Army. One of the biggest legends credited among their accomplishments is the eradication of over 40 million people in their pursuit to make Genghis Khan the sole ruler of the entire earth. The truth is slightly less twisted. It is true that a great deal of men and women lost their lives under the charge of incessant hooves of Mongol horses, but the numbers are not as extreme as it's usually claimed. Genghis Khan was one sly and shrewd politician, and his diplomacy was only matched by his ruthlessness and wrath on the battlefield. It is true a great deal of lives were harmed by the Mongols to establish a dominance, but they often used these rare examples to intimidate their opposition into rethinking their defense capabilities, thus forcing them to surrender and welcome their new overlord who as a reward would spare them from carnage, such as the incident that happened in a Persian city called Nishapur. 1,748,000 civilians paid for the mistake of one Persian archer who managed to eliminate Genghis's favorite son-in-law, Tokachar. On his newly widowed daughter's request, Genghis Khan ordered the elimination of every citizen left alive in Nishapur. Well, Genghis Khan was far from the most despised emperor in the world. For one, when he took lives, he spared none to loathe him later. Second, his empire was also an alliance of many individual groups and subsidiary kingdoms, where sitting kings were allowed to rule under Khan's name. His rule allowed administrative reforms and religious tolerance that ultimately benefited the common people, who were more than happy to cheer for the new overlord. Some regions didn't even require fear-mongering and instead welcomed Mongol armies to take over leadership and for stability and protection. So why did they not fear him? Who knows? Do you have any more war lies you want to share? Let us know in the comments and please be sure to like and subscribe for more Nutty History. See you next time, beautiful people.